This is the third audio lecture for chapter 18. This audio lecture is going to cover classification of viruses and also acellular infectious agents. So with um, classification of viruses, there are universal uniform um, classification systems. So they were first developed in 1971. There's different systems. We'll be looking at one system in particular that the textbook references, and that's very popular, that looks at the genome. Um, there are currently uh, approximately 2,000 viruses. Um, they can be put into nine different orders. That then branches out to 131 families. There are subfamilies, and then there's um, genres. When we look at virus classification um, in different systems, to classify them, they can use different characteristics. Um, the most common one is a nucleic acid type. So whether it's DNA, whether it's RNA, whether it's single-stranded, double-stranded, um, and again, we're, that's the system we will be focusing on. Um, one of those systems is called the Baltimore system. Um, there are systems that also look at whether there is a presence or absence of envelope, also the shape of the capsid and also the dimension, the size of the virons and the capsid. So um, you can see the uh, nucleotide classification allows you to look at the sequence. Um, so you could sequence it and then determine classification. Um, with these other classification systems, we actually have to have the intact virus to look at um, and to determine what's its shape, what's its size, um, does it have an envelope, does it not? Um, and we, if we look at the presence and absence of envelope, that's not, <laughs> it's an either or, so it's like there's two groups and that's it. So again, um, the nucleic acid um, classification systems are the more popular one. So with the Baltimore classification system, again, they're gonna focus, it focuses on the viral genome and then how, um, that viral genome is processed and used to synthesize viral mRNA and then protein. Um, there are seven different groups um, within this system. We'll look at slides for each one of them, so I'm not going to go into too much detail right now because I'm going to point out that remember that in a eukaryotic cell um, and even a bacterial cell, DNA is normally double-stranded and RNA is normally single-stranded. So you'll notice we have double-stranded DNA viruses. This is actually the largest group. We also have single-strand um, DNA viruses, so this goes kind of against what normally is found in the cell. It's different. We have double-stranded RNA, another different form than what we normally see. And then we have positive strand, single, positive strand, single strand <laughs> RNA viruses. Now these, um, the form that the RNA is in can produce protein. So it is like mRNA. And then we also have negative strand, single strand RNA viruses. This is the complement strand. Um, so it cannot be utilized to make RNA, but it can act as a template to make the protein coding RNA. Um, it can also serve as a template to um, synthesize, to end up synthesizing genome. And then we have two additional um, groups, the retroviruses and reverse transcribing DNA viruses. So both of those use reverse transcriptase um, in order to go from RNA to DNA. Um, with retroviruses that going that reverse transcriptase going from RNA to DNA is so that they can incorporate into the host genome for reverse transcribing DNA viruses they are going through that process to then produce complement DNA to then make message RNA um, and again we'll talk we're going to be talking about each of these in more detail keeping in mind that this is an overview um, if you were taking virology you would probably spend <laughs> two to three weeks just going through the different types of viruses and then spending additional time talking about each of the different groups and some of the nuances between them. So with that, double-stranded DNA viruses, um, these are the largest groups of known viruses. So we've talked quite a bit about bacteriophage. So bacteriophage would be an example of a double-stranded DNA viruses. There are additional um, ones obviously, and some of those are infect vertebrates like the herpes viruses, 
which is a number of different viruses that fall under that group. There's also viruses that infect um, insects. And so again, with double-stranded DNA virus, because their genome is like our genome, they can utilize the, DNA, the host DNA and RNA polymerase. So what you see here in this figure here is where we have our viral genome on the left. And again, because it's double-stranded utilizing DNA polymerase, we can have genome replication. If we utilize RNA polymerase, we can have transcription of mRNA that gets us translation of protein. Those proteins then are produced and then assembled like we see this bacteriophage. Um, again, keep in mind that these processes can, can be happening at the same time. So it's not, it's not like an either or thing. Um, and also if you're being infected, you could have multiple copies, multiple viruses infecting a single cell, so we'd have multiple copies of the genome. To give you some examples of double-stranded eukaryotic viruses, again, herpes virus um, is the main, one of the major groups. That would include herpes simplex virus 1 and 2, which are responsible for cold sores and genital herpes, respectfully. This also includes varicella um, virus, and that is responsible for chicken pox and shingles. There's also CMV virus, Epstein-Barr virus. Um, this is known to cause uh, mono and can also lead to some cancers. There's HHV7 and 6 that can affect kids. HHV8 um, leads to Kaposi um, sarcomas in HIV patients, which is a type of a very... Um, specific type of cancer, which um, is seen in, again, AIDS patients. So like a co-infection. Uh, this just um, shows you the life cycle of herpes virus um, in a general sense. <laughs> so what you'll see is that we have receptor-mediated attachment. Um, that is going to allow for entry on an on coating. Um, because this is a double-stranded DNA virus, that, DNA, that genome is going to enter into the nucleus. Um, it is linear to begin with, but then it will circular, become circular. Um, and then we will get the production of mRNA from that and so then proteins will be expressed. There are early, um, immediate early and early proteins. Um, some of these are important for that DNA, DNA replication of the genome. And then there's late um, gene transcription and that is important for viral structural proteins that like make up the capsid. Here we see a single-stranded DNA virus um, and so with a single strand DNA virus. Um, again, keep in mind that it is missing <laughs> part of it. It's missing its complement strand um, that we would normally find. And so in this figure down below, you can see how we have a single strand and it would use the DNA polymerase in order to make a copy, um, the complement. And so with that DNA, with the double-stranded DNA, now we can then utilize that to make our RNA, our RNA, that is going to allow us to make proteins. And again, at the same time, we can also use that as the template to make the right, the genome DNA, which is single-stranded. Okay. Um, just to give you an example of a virus that is single-stranded DNA, parvovirus um, B19, which causes fifth disease in humans, which is characterized by a skin rash, um, is caused by a single-stranded um, DNA. There's only three proteins in its genome. With double-stranded RNA viruses, um, rotaviruses, um, which can cause, lead to diarrhea and dehydration and kills over 200,000 children worldwide each year, um, is a double-stranded RNA virus, just again, to give you an example. So because this is a double-stranded RNA virus, one of the strands can be utilized, um, the positive strand can be utilized in order to synthesize proteins. But when it replicates, it needs to, when it's replicating its genome, it then needs to make complements and it needs to make both the positive and the negative strand so that you can get assembly. Um, as you see the figure of the life cycle, you can see that um, those processes that happen like attachment on coding, entry on coding, synthesis, assembly are all occurring here. 
For positive strand RNA um, viruses, these can be um, non-segmented or segmented. So it depends upon the virus <laughs> and what form its genome comes into. Because it is positive strand uh, and that can synthesize protein, um, you can have immediate translation from that, RNA, that positive strand RNA genome. Um, and then at the same time, usually what, can ha what will happen is that um, you will synthesize the complement RNA strand and then utilize that for replication um, of the genome. Just to give you some examples of some viruses that fall under the category of positive strand RNA, things like rubella, meas um, German measles, also known as German measles, um, equine encephalitis, dengue, West Nile, Zika, hepatitis C, hepatitis A, polio, rhinovirus, which is the common cold, and Coxsackie virus. There's also um, plant viruses that are positive strand RNA. Um, so the way that they enter through the host is through embrasion. So there, be, there would be some kind of wound on the plant and that then allows um, the virus to enter. So one example is the tobacco um, mosaic virus or TMV. Um, and so you can see that there. There are additional um, things that we want to keep in mind when we have plant viruses. So for some of them, because of the replication of the virus, um, it actually will kind of get trapped in the phloem, which is the vasculature of the plant. So think of those as like the blood vessels of the plant. Um, that is the fluid that's moving through from there, right? Um, so sometimes we tap the phloem it's high in sugar, and then we consume it in like maple syrup. Um, they can also move cell to cell through um, pla the plasma desmosome. So you might remember that because um, in like an intro bio class, you might have taken the underside of a plant leaf, um, and you can actually put like a thin coat of nail polish on, peel that off, look at it under the microscope, and you can actually see the desmosome structure and that will open and close and allow it's meant to allow for respiration of the plant um, but this also can allow for the virus to exit and then enter other desmosomes um, but there needs to be some kind of it requires some kind of viral movement protein to do that transfer Next, we have the negative stranded RNA viruses. Um, so a lot of these are enveloped. Um, so and very common for them to be animal viruses. They vary in their morphology. Um, and then they also vary in their genomes on whether they're segmented or non-segmented. So um, because these are the negative or minus sense um, RNA, again, keep in mind, we can't code pro protein right away. We need to make the complement strand so that we can make protein. That complement strand can also be utilized in order to um, synthesize genome, which we'll see in the next slide. To give you some examples of some of the families and some of the um, viruses that fall under negative strand RNA, um, you are familiar with influenza through our class activity, um, but also measles, mumps, um, RSV, rabies, and Ebola. Um, those are also negative strand. Um, so again, this is what, um, when we have a negative strand virus, um, because we can't, that RNA strand doesn't code for protein, we have to make the complement, which does code for protein. So we then can um, synthesize proteins um, using the host cells machinery. And then for, uh, you can also use that positive strand to then make the negative strand, which is your actual genome. So um, again, it's important to keep in mind with negative strand viruses, they can't serve as the mRNA to form viral proteins. We have a step before that happens. Um, so uh, we're going to look a little more closely at influenza virus. So again, um, with our class activity, some of the questions um, focused around um, involved influenza. Um, so some of this you might be familiar with because your question might, those might've been the questions you answered, but um, everybody should understand <laughs> that with influenza virus being a negative strand RNA virus, um, it has a segmented genome 
and each of the segments actually has its own capsid. So it actually contains eight nucleocapsid, and you'll see that in the next figure. And when it enters into the cell, it enters in an endosome, and then what happens is there's a low pH, and that causes conformational changes to hemagglutin protein. When those conformational changes happen, it causes the membranes of the endosome and the envelope of the influenza to then fuse. So um, again, keep in mind there was three different ways which viruses can enter. And so this is not where we're having fusion of the plasma membrane. This is being brought in through endocytosis, put into a vesicle, and then that vesicle has a drop in the pH and that causes this whole cascade of events that ends up leading to the nucleocapsid being released on coding occurs and then now we have um, to create the um, take that template and have genome synthesis and mRNA synthesis so that we can then make proteins um, the exit how influenza gets out is through the virus budding um, and that's how it acquires its envelope through the plasma membrane so here you can see um, that kind of life cycle and also the structure of the influenza. So looking at that structure of influenza, you'll notice that it has a number of different glycoproteins on its surface. So some of those are marked with an NA, that's for neurominidase. ACE is an enzyme, so it has en enzymatic activity. And then the H, hemagglutin, um, that's what allows for, um, that is what's having a conformational change and then leading to the release of the nucleocapsids, the eight of them, because it's segmented um, into the cell. So again, um, you can see that in our image here of that life cycle um, for that. So with influenza infection, um, it's a really nice model for understanding um, host range and how those glycoproteins are really important at affecting with what is the host range. So what organisms can be infected? And there's additional work. There's just a paper that came out that I was like looking at. <laughs> and uh, it's really cool. I might share it, but it, it is a little beyond like any expectation I have of anybody of understanding. Um, but a little background. Um, when we look at influenza, there's actually four different types, A, B, C, and D. Influenza A is the most common, um, and it has, um, the type itself has a wide host range, but individual serotypes um, based on the H's and N's have certain hosts that they will infect. Um, humans are susceptible to influenza A, B, and in rare cases, C. Uh, D does not tend to, um, to my knowledge, infect humans, um, just in case there's some kind of obscure case. <laughs> but so most, in the, for the most part, we focus on influenza type A, and influenza type A gets classified by its H's and N's. Okay, so um, you'll see here, um, there is, I did put this influenza paper up on D2L in case you do want to read through it. Um, no expect expectation to do so. But what you'll notice is that there's certain um, combinations of H's, hemagglutin, and N's, neuraminidase, that have organisms that they end up infecting. Um, and so, you know, when we're looking at like pigs, they have certain serotypes of influenza type A that will infect them, such as H1N1. We talked in class how H1N1 um, actually used, was called originally the swine flu. Um, it is also an example of a zoonotic because H1N1 ended up infecting in 19, um, 1918 humans. And we hadn't had any exposure and immunity to that. So it actually killed millions of people. It's also known as the Spanish flu at that time. Keep in mind it was 1918 and prior, so like we didn't have um, the tools we do nowadays. So some of that material was saved, um, and then later on when we could look at um, hemagglutin and neuraminidase and characterize those, um, because that was our first um, 
archived sample, it was denoted as H1N1. Um, additional hemagglutins in neuraminidases have been identified. And then also in 2009, there was um, cases of H1 um, in, hum in humans again. H1N1 has been part of the vaccine um, that has been given. Most influenza vaccines have at least three different strains, if not four strains. So some are trivalent and some are quadvalent. If we talk, you know, opportunity to talk about vaccines, we'll talk about that more. Um, but that just gives you better coverage. And nowadays, H1N1 is one of those strains um, that is put in there. Um, you'll notice in the humans, not only H1N1, but also H3N2 is a common strain. Um, so that is another strain that is um, commonly put into uh, the human flu vaccines. Now, if you were to vaccinate your dog, um, horse or cat for influenza, they receive different um, strains in their vaccines because they're susceptible to different um, stereotypes of influenza. So you'll notice with the dog, they are susceptible to H. 3 and 2. Well, we live in close, close proximity with dogs. Um, so a lot of times host range um, will have shared species, especially if they are they live in close proximity because it gives a, um, a higher likelihood that um, the virus would end up having a host. You'll notice that H7N7, um, that's actually common between horses and dogs. And then we also have H3N7. Eight, that's also common between horses and dogs. Okay, so um, I do want to point out with cattle, um, there is H5N1, which is also known as the bird flu. So it actually originated in birds and it has crossed over into some species. Um, so you also notice it's also marked down here as just um, for some of the mammals here and also marine mammals. But um, I've Interestingly, um, lately there's been some cases of bird flu in dairy farms. Um, and I had mentioned in class how there's been, there was an individual that worked at a dairy farm that was human and they end up um, developing bird flu. So they started to look to try to identify where did they directly interact with birds and get exposed that way? Or was there some other exposure and they actually found it in cows? And the paper that just came out that, um, if you're interested, I can share, um, actually looks at what is the cell that is allowing, what cell type is allowing for replication in cows. And they're actually finding in the mammary glands, um, that is where replication is actually occurring. So they thought it was in the gut, um, but it's not. <laughs> well, or it, um, it could still be, but um, they found that there was high levels of H1N1 um, influenza in the mammary glands when they did staining and, and indicates and supports that that is where replication is occurring in cows. So interesting paper. Um, again, it's not that you have to memorize all these H's and, H's and N's. This is just meant to demonstrate and give you an example of host range. Um, I would say H1N1 you should know. Um, and given that we did talk about in class about bird flu, um, H5N1. So um, as I mentioned with retroviruses, this is where we are going to have an RNA virus and they are going to reverse transcription, have reverse transcription and produce DNA. Um, and so they use an enzyme called reverse transcriptase to do this. And this goes against central dogma. Um, so this is a unique feature of these um, viruses and so in many cases they are actually going to have, I mean they're going to have to have not only the genome for it um, in their genome to code for reverse transcriptase in some cases that this is one of these enzymes that they will um, synthesize and include in their capsid. So here we see we create DNA from the um, positive DNA RNA strand. We make the complement and then that double-stranded DNA is utilized to produce additional RNA so that we can produce proteins and we can also have the genome present.
An example of a retrovirus is HIV. Um, so again, we did our class activity and HIV was in, involved in some of the questions. So you might be already familiar with HIV. Um, HIV stands for human immunodeficient virus. Um, it ends up causing acquired immunodeficiency deficiency syndrome, AIDS. Um, so with HIV, it will infect your CD4 T cells. It can also infect dendritic cells and macrophages because those cell types have the receptor that allows the virus to enter. And in the process of entering and replication, it will kill those cells. Um, when you kill your CD4 T cells, it affects how your immune system can respond, hence acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. So an individual can be infected with HIV, but their immune system hasn't been impacted yet, so they um, haven't progressed to progression of AIDS. Um, there are individuals infected with HIV and have AIDS um, globally, so this is an important virus for us to have an understanding, and a virus that um, work has been done to develop, develop antivirals. Um, so that um, even if you're infected, that switching to like a lytic state um, where cells are being killed um, is less likely to occur. There's two major um, groups, HIV-1 and HIV-2. Um, so HIV-1 is more common in cases where it progresses to AIDS um, in the U.S. Um, HIV-2, that... Um, form is more common in developing nations where it is less likely to develop into AIDS um, for that. With HIV-1, it is an envelope virus. It actually has um, two copies of its RNA genome. It brings reverse transcriptase and integrase to um, in its capsid. So when it infects a cell, it's bringing those enzymes. And that's because in its life cycle, it will utilize those enzymes, reverse transcriptase, to make DNA from its RNA. And then the integrase allows it to take that viral DNA and integrate it into the host genome. So now the host, um, even if you fight the act of infection, um, you have that genome um, inserted into the cells, which can get turned on later. So with the initial infections, um, what you would see in that figure is that GP120 will bind to the CD4 T cells, macrophages, dendritic cells, monocytes. All these are immune cells. They have the receptor that allows entry, which is CCRX5. Um, and so um, it will bind to that receptor and gain entry. The viral envelope fuses with fuses with the plasma membrane, and um, we get entry of that genome, of, of that capsid. Reverse, um, with reverse transcriptase, we have RNA-dependent DNA polymerase, DNA-dependent DNA polymerase, um, ribonuclease, uh, and so these can be error prone and there's no proofreading capability to it so it can lead to um, mutations uh, then the hiv will undergo synthesis assembly and then release so the double-stranded dna is moved into the nucleus with integrase and other proteins it integrates um, into the dna of the host as i mentioned so that proviral dna um, enters into the genome and that forces the cell to then synthesize viral RNA, message RNA. And splicing brain um, allows for the different coding regions um, to be synthesized into proteins. Um, and then we have a symbol, budding occurs, and then this can lead to that immune cell dying if there's that active infection going on. But again, keep in mind there's been incorporation into the genome um, so if that cell doesn't die, um, you would still have the potential for an infection. And again, keep in mind the role of reverse transcriptase for retroviruses is um, 
to integrate, to be able to integrate the DNA into the host genome. With reverse transcribing DNA viruses, um, and this is one of the one of the groups that I don't expect you to know as well. Um, in this case, the folk, the purpose of the reverse transcriptase is to take the genome and make complement, um, so that you then have complement DNA to make message RNA to make protein. So it's a little, it's not about the incorporation because they don't have the integrase to incorporate it into the genome. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about a couple different acellular infectious agents. Um, the first one is viroids. So these infectious agents are actually circular, single-stranded RNA. Um, that RNA actually doesn't code for any protein products, um, but it gets replicated by the host cell and that ends up causing damage to the plant. So you can see in this image from a review paper about viroids, which is posted up on D2L, um, you can see the potato and the potato on the left is a healthy potato and the potato on the right is one that's infected by viroids. And so you can see probably not so appealing um, and because it has been damaged because of the replication of the viroids. Um, there are... Um, many different species of plants that can be affected by viroids. So again, in this image, you can see everything from peaches to eggplants to mums, um, even citrus fruit are susceptible to these viroids. Um, and so it affects the plant. Um, it makes any of the fruit it produces smaller and less appealing. Um, and again, it can affect the vascular, the vascular system of the plant. And they are RNA based. With satellites, these can be either DNA or RNA based. Um, I really don't expect you to know these, just know that I guess most maybe know there's another example. I would prefer you to focus on viroids because we talked a bit about those in class and also prion diseases. So we had quite the discussion about prion diseases in class, um, but they are protein based um, infectious particles. And so they can infect the central nervous system and depending upon where they are affecting can affect what symptoms you have. Um, individuals will end up um, developing like brain, brain lesions um, due to these unfolded proteins. Um, keep in mind, um, central dogma says we have to have DNA to make RNA to then make protein. Um, and But yet with Puron diseases, um, you get infected and then what happens, it recruits additional proteins to misfold, which is um, kind of not what we <laughs> learn in intro bio or any of our classes, right? So um, we're still trying to understand Puron diseases, prion diseases, um, and it's not until like the last 10 years that there's really been significant funding and development and um, important findings in the research that was being done. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that um, uh, more so. But um, when we are looking at prion diseases, um, they can affect humans, they can affect animals. Um, so we see different, um, different presentation of the disease. So one pr um, prion disease is scrapies, it infects sheep. Um, and so when they um, get infected, they end up scraping. Um, and so they end up scraping against wood post <laughs> fences and they keep scraping and scraping. And so they end up scraping um, through the skin, through muscle, to the bone. Um, and normally the central nervous system would tell them to stop doing that before that progressed to that point. Um, but because of the infection, um, they're not getting that feedback of this is painful, this you need to stop, and they continue to scrape. Um, so that was one of the first um, kind of documented cases of Puron diseases. And then um, we also have um, Puron diseases that infect cattle. Um, so there's what's known as mad cow disease. Um, so there was uh, normally if a cow um, has mad cow disease, they... Um, may have problems, they're not uncoordinated, they can't stand, um, they even might, cows produce a lot of saliva, but they will 
um, swallows that saliva and it helps in digesting their food. Um, a cow that has mad cow disease doesn't have that reflex in order to swallow that saliva. So they end up having this kind of mad appearance. They can also show aggression. So if you've ever been around cows, they, um, not bulls, but just <laughs> your normal dairy cow, um, they don't tend to be aggressive like that. Um, so obviously they might protect their um, calf, but again, they're not um, overly aggressive and they don't have like a mad appearance to them. Um, but um, when they are infected with Puron diseases and develop mad cow disease, um, those are some of the symptoms you might see. With cows, if they're not able to stand um, and they're going um, into our food chain um, for human consumption, they're not allowed to enter. So they're what's known as downer cows. So downer cows, the guidelines, laws are that they cannot be put into the food chain. In the UK, there were some cases where um, a cow cows made it into the food chain um, and it was during a time when there were some cases of mad cow disease so there was concern that people might end up developing um, mad cow disease um, but Puron disease by consuming uh, meat from these animals. One of the practices I didn't talk about in class is that um, Farmers like not to lose money. <laughs> and so sometimes these downer cows won't enter into the human food chain, but they might be utilized um, as food on the farm. Um, and so we now know that Puron diseases are really resistant to different um, sterilization methods. And so that means that even if that, um, that cow that was potentially infected was processed uh, and um, treated so that it, the material that was generated from it would be sterile. It does not mean that the purons are removed. And so there are cases where those cows and the material from the cows were fed back to the cows and then the cows within the herd end up developing mad cow disease. Um, so again, um, basic infectious disease says this is not a good idea um, and so we don't see that practice being utilized as much at least not <laughs> um, that, that uh, USDA and, and such organizations are made aware of that. There are human forms of Puron disease um, so the first one curare um, that's actually due to consumption of human um, and so um, this is found in certain tribes where um, consumption of human meat and products is a sign of respect. Um, and so when an elder dies or someone dies, um, they will consume parts of the body. Um, and what they have seen is that the individuals that end up eating the brain material are higher, more likely to end up developing curare. Curare is um, characterized by um, shaking, um, uh, like uncontrollable shaking and again that's due to the lesions that form in the brain. There are also um, variations that are due to um, genetic mutations that are passed on. Um, there are also spontaneous mutations that can occur that can lead to um, prion diseases and then there's also the ones that are acquired. So CJD um, is the most common Puron, human form of Puron diseases, um, and generally what individuals get classified if it's acquired. So um, how someone might acquire CJD, um, one of the most common ways is through consuming of mammals that are infected. Um, and again, if um, that meat is contaminated with um, any of the brain material, it's more likely to happen. So if you um, hunt um, and you're processing your own animal and you're not careful in how you're processing and some of the meat might get contaminated with brain material or you are consuming that brain material, um, that puts you at increased risk of developing CJD. For CJD, the presentation of it um, usually starts with like um, person's forgetting things, um, it becomes progressively worse, um, they forget like, um, like 
you know, can be driving down the street and they forget where they're going. They forget like, where do they work? Where, where's home? Who are the people around that? So it really presents kind of like, um, Alzheimer's and dementia, but it's very, um, fast progression, um, of the deterioration. Um, and it also tends to be younger individuals. So the on time of onset usually is between 30 and 40 years for most individuals. Um, and there is a skewing to males developing CJD versus females. And again, um, it's believed some of that is due to, uh, like being involved in hunting and that. And just disclaimer, I'm not, I'm not saying anything's, you know, wrong with hunting. <laughs> I'm just saying that uh, it is an activity that puts you at risk because you are hunting, um, potentially hunting an organism that could um, have Puron diseases. So there's been some outbreaks in the U.S. of Puron disease within elk and deer population. Um, there's a number of states that report that they do have, they do not have any cases of chronic wasting disease, which is the deer and elk form of Puron diseases. It's also in the media, it's referred to as zo deer zombies um, because uh, normally a deer will like flee if you, it sees a human or a car, um, but these, they don't do that. They are very slow, uncoordinated, moving. Um, they can also um, have excessive saliva coming out of their mouth. Um, they tend to have poor weight because they forget that they need to eat or they don't even know how to eat. Um, and so again, consumption of that can um, lead to transmission. Um, there is, um, so, so obviously like if there is known chronic wasting disease within um, your deer or elk population that can have a dramatic impact on whether people would hunt in your area or state, right? Um, and things like hunting it, it can be a huge source of revenue for these states. So um, again, there's some certain states that say there is no um, chronic wasting disease in our elk and deer. However, hunt hunters have reported they have seen um, deer that meet that criteria based on symptoms for diagnose, uh, diagnosis. With Puron diseases, um, generally um, or historically, uh, proper confirmation of diagnosis, it cannot be done until an autopsy can be done um, where the brain um, is examined um, closely to see whether there is any um, lesions and also if there's any purons. In 2013, in the New England area, there was a case where an individual had CJD, um, but prior to them passing, they had neurosurgery done. With the neurosurgery, there was a piece of equipment that was utilized. Um, that piece of equipment was very specialized, so what hospitals do is rent them out. Um, it was utilized at that hospital for some additional individuals. Um, and then it moved to a different hospital in the New England area. And again, an ad additional individuals um, potentially were exposed to, say, to Purons because, again, they are resistant to standard cleaning methods. Um, so because um, they took normal precautions in cleaning um, the piece of equipment between individuals, but because of it being, because of the resistance of purons to those cleaning, to cleaning methods in general, um, there is a potential that those individuals were exposed. So there's about 13 individuals that were notified and are being watched to see whether they develop, um, any symptoms. Puron diseases, um, between, the time of exposure to the on first onset of diseases can be anywhere for years, um, even reported decades. Um, it's one of the reasons why in old textbooks they're referred to as slow viruses. Um, and also, um, and at one point it was also thought they were RNA, right? <laughs> but they're actually protein. Um, once you start developing symptoms, um, it does usually take a little bit of time for the potential diagnosis. Um, again, diagnosis is more ruling out other things that it could be like Alzheimer's, like MS, um, other things that can lead to lesions in the brain, and also marked by the progression of loss of um, function and memory and such. Um, 
So usually by the time you get in with a neurologist and actually get um, identified as having potential CJD, it's six months until you pass. Um, so you can imagine for these individuals that were pretend, may be exposed during neurosurgery, which is one of the other ways that you can acquire CJD, um, it, it's kind of a waiting game to see whether they end up developing it. I had mentioned in class, um, University of Colorado um, has a lab setting with deer. They're looking at modes of transmission between the deer population. Um, we used to think it was just brain material <laughs> that would lead to transmission. Um, the research they were showing um, that should be published by now um, actually showed that transmission can happen by sharing of water buckets, um, feed, feeding troughs, um, whether they came in contact with urine or fecal material. So there was no direct contact wasn't needed. Um, there are some of these purons are left behind in the saliva um, shed in the urine and fecal material. And animals were be, when they were exposed to that would end up developing these purine diseases. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is there are some diagnostic tests nowadays because of that outbreak in 2013. Um, so you now can um, test for purine diseases in spinal fluid. So um, a spinal tap can be done and then it can be screened for purine diseases. It is possible for you to have misfolded proteins though that are not purines. Um, so it is a um, test that is used to evaluate like risk factor. So if you have a high amount of these misfold of misfolded proteins, that is a strong indication that with clinical symptoms that you do have CJD. Um, true confirmation can't happen until after. Um, and there are some mouse models that are utilized for research and also diagnostics um, testing. So as I mentioned, what's interesting with, um, besides everything, <laughs> what's really interesting with purine diseases is that you end up having this purine protein. Um, so we actually have normal forms of it, but then there ends up being this abnormal form where it misfolds. And that's what's the infectious um, agent that leads to the development of symptoms. And what um, ends up happening is that these misfolded proteins then um, recruit other purine proteins that are normal to end up misfold, misfolding. So again, there's no DNA, there's no RNA, it's just proteins recruiting others to end up becoming abnormal. And again, um, our understanding of how they do that um, is being looked at in research. Um, these are really interesting. Um, it's a very interesting category. Um, and each organism in fact um, I think is very interesting because the presentation is so different and again um, like if we look at scrapies um, that's going back into records of, of farmers describing these um, this behavior in these sheep and then fast forward and saying okay this is why it's actually what it's due to. So as always, if you have any questions, please let me know. I'm more than happy to answer those questions, but hopefully this provides you with an overview of the classification of viruses and those additional um, acellular infectious agents. And again, please focus on viroids and purons. Um, and again, <laughs> have a good day.